Okay, well, welcome everybody to Solar Noon Tuesday. And uh, as per normal, we're going to go through the highlights, the, the news of the week in the solar uh, photovoltaic industry, then hit some of the uh, events that are coming up. And then we do a little bit of a deep dive into a specific topic. Uh, so let's get started. This is for the week of October 29th. And in the news, a recent study by the International Energy Agency has found that solar as an industry globally is well on its way to having enough manufacturing capacity to meet some of the interim targets that they've set. Uh, they've, they've anticipated how much manufacturing facility will be needed for by 2030 uh, to meet a net zero carbon emissions goal by 2050. So hopefully those numbers all make sense to you. Um, when we look at how solar compares with some of the other industries that they're they're looking at, solar is with all of the existing and announced manufacturing at about 130% of the capacity necessary. Now, one of the takeaways I would make from that is like in a lot of situations, I think we're gonna see some of the manufacturing capacity overbuilt so we're probably going to see a boom and bust kind of thing coming up here in a year or two where they've been ramping up this capacity so quickly. And I think they're going to have excess capacity to meet the needs. So that's something to watch in, say, a year or two years at the outset. Battery technology, looking at about 93 percent of what's anticipated. And you can see from this diagram, a lot of that is to be built. So um, we'll we'll see if that actually comes through. Hydrogen, I'm not all that keen on hydrogen. I think that's uh, hydrogen is the the technology of the future and always will be. So I, I take that with a grain of salt. But the interesting thing, wind turbines and geothermal heat pumps, uh, only at about 36% of the manufacturing capacity of what will be required to meet these incentives or to meet these uh, goals that have been put in place. Speaking of component production, there have been a lot of solar projects that have been announced, um, manufacturing projects. There was another one this week, uh, $800 million uh, project manufacturing facility that's being installed by Canadian Solar, and it's going to be in Jeffersonville, um, Indiana. And it looks to employ about 1,200 people and will be opening sometime in mid-early uh, 2025. But I, I thought I would highlight the inverter capacity because, of course, the components, there's solar panels, there's inverters, and then there's everything else, the balance of systems. Um, but there have been a lot of inverter announcements recently. Siemens just announced that they're opening up a utility-scale plant up in Wisconsin. Enphase has recently announced three different manufacturing facilities here in the U.S., in South Carolina and Texas, and also in the booming uh, region of Wisconsin for inverters. And then uh, Selectria is uh, opening up a facility in Illinois. Power Electronics has a plant down in Texas. And then Fronius, which I announced last week, is opening up another um, facility to make inverters in Indiana. So a lot of activity going on on the domestic manufacturing front. Uh, those within the industry will often refer to what they call like the 15 cent rule, the 15 cent threshold. And what they mean by this, if you've ever run across it, is that essentially if, if electric prices are greater than 15 cents per kilowatt hour by the local utility, then solar is an easier sell. It, it's That's kind of where it makes a lot more sense. It's obvious at the residential level. Um, so, so we've just passed that threshold nationally here in the United States. Um, U.S. solar has been growing, but it's still a relatively small portion of the population. Only about 5% of the homes have solar uh, installed on, on the property. Uh, it's a lot of homes, but it's a small percentage. And that's largely due to the fact that electricity prices here in the U.S. have been relatively low. Uh, countries like Germany, where the average kilowatt hour price is around 40 cents, 
versus around 15 cents here, they see about a 20% market penetration. And Australia, which benefits from a lot of sunlight, but it also has relatively high electric prices, about 28 cents per kilowatt hour Australian, which translates to about um, 17 cents, 18 cents uh, in US dollars. And they have about a um, 30% um, market penetration down in Australia. Uh, some of these um, places that, that uh, the states that are higher than 15 cents, there are about 16 of them here. Highest is going to be Hawaii uh, at right at around 43 cents. Now we've seen rapid increases in solar or in electric prices in the last couple of years. Uh, from 2021 to 2022, the average price was around 11%. From 2022 to 2023, saw a 13% rise. And I was looking into it, trying to figure out why these prices are going up so rapidly, because we keep harping about how solar and wind, the prices keep coming down. Utilities are transitioning over to solar and wind increasingly, uh, yet the prices are going up and up and up. Now, uh, I looked into that AEP spokesperson says this is all because of increased global demand, supply chain disruptions, economic uncertainty, and the war in Ukraine. Okay, so those are the reasons why your electric prices went up. Although I also looked into it and found that AEP's profits rose 11% from 2021 to 2022 to $12.5 billion in profits. And they paid their CEO, Nicholas Atkins, over $16 million uh, in salary and bonuses. So I figure that's not bad for a fully regulated um, industry that uh, is guaranteed a profit. So, so maybe an increase of 11% and profit increases of 11% seems to be something in that. So uh, who knows, who am I to say? Maybe uh, let's blame Ukraine. Okay, over the past decade or so, uh, the solar industry has seen a steady um, and sometimes dramatic decreases in prices. But in the last couple of years, we have seen those prices ticking up just a wee bit. And this, and it sounds like a cop-out, like I'm AAP spokesperson, but a lot of it is because of supply chain disruptions and, and tariffs that have been, been imposed on imported solar parts. But we're seeing that in the first quarter of this year, some of these prices are stabilizing a bit. This diagram here shows uh, historically what's been going on with these prices, both at the residential and at the uh, utility scale. Um, in the first quarter of 2023, we did see prices fall about 15% for residential, down from uh, $3.18 per watt installed to about $2.68. Now, this is for just simple grid tied with no battery backup, no storage of any sort. Utility scale prices, uh, they did rise slightly from $1.07 to about $1.16, and that is... Um, uh, largely, the price of the panels have been coming down, but a lot of the metal, the balance of system stuff, those prices continue to increase. So the aluminum prices, uh, copper prices, things like that. And Ohio is going to get its first floating solar array. Uh, this is going to be available in mid-2024. They're anticipating it'll be done. It's a partnership between D3 Energy and Delco Water, uh, Delco Services, Delaware, Ohio. I assume Delco stands for Delaware County, maybe. Um, and um, it's located just north of Columbus, Ohio. This 3.2 megawatt array is going to be located on one of their cooling ponds up there, expected to be completed, as I said, in mid-24, and uh, will provide about 50% of the power for that utility. And that's the news that I've identified for this week. Anybody have anything they want to add uh, for the good of the cause from the folks online here? So I'll give you just a second there. All right, feel free to interrupt. Don't want to have long, long uh, pauses here. So let's let's hit some of the um, events that are coming up here soon. Um, today, actually, this afternoon at one o'clock, uh, Community EV Charging is having a, a webinar from Clean Future Ohio. 
Then at 2 p.m., so you can spend all day on the computer here today, Everbolt Home Energy Systems. This is one of the proprietary systems. Uh, this one's offered by Panasonic. Uh, so if you're interested in that kind of system, um, that is going to be on this afternoon. Uh, November 1st, um, Power Lines and Wildfires. I, I thought this one looked pretty interesting. Um, it's, uh, you know, oftentimes you'll hear like in California, the wildfires were caused by power lines. Uh, just curious as to why that is, how that happens, what, what they're doing to prevent that. Uh, November 6th at 2 p.m., uh, Exploring Codes, Safety, and Resilience. This is put on by IREC. Uh, IREC is an organization, I think it stands Inter Interstate Renewable Energy Council, I believe. Um, and they'll put that on uh, November 7th at 2 p.m., tackling costs, labor shortages, and logistics. This is a Wood McKenzie um, webinar. I think this is more um, utility scale. Uh, Trina Solar Tracking Systems going to be on November 8th at 2 p.m. Uh, and I just should mention, I'm giving you these. Uh, I don't have the links for you. They they change. They it's too much. They're weird. So anyway, you can Google these if you need to find them. Uh, and I, I did want to mention that here in Ohio, uh, we're having the third annual Ohio Energy Conference. It's up. In, it's in Columbus um, on November 8th and 9th. Uh, I'm actually going to be attending there. I've got a booth there. And uh, it's a good conference. It's a nice smallish type conference, but a lot of good content. So if you're so inclined, I'd encourage you to uh, to go there. It's one of the better conferences for, for solar that I've run across. And uh, November 9th at 2 p.m., there's a webinar uh, expanding into commercial and industrial. So if you're selling residential, you want to get into commercial and industrial, that one's coming up. Uh, utility scale design on November 14th, 2 p.m., and November 15th, uh, there's another utility scale, uh, DERMS in New Mexico, DERMS. That's Distributed Energy uh, Resource Management System software. So very much a utility scale kind of uh, webinar. And then there's on the 15th at 2 p.m., these are all Eastern time, uh, LEADS, a LEADS Tech Talk, which is put on by the U.S. Green Energy Council. And then uh, the subject of what we're going to be talking about here today, uh, Google's new solar API program on November 16th, 2 p.m. There will be a webinar on that. So you can get deeper into it if you want. And then on November 24th at 2 p.m., there's charting the path through the energy transition. Uh, I think that's more thought thought ideas or forward planning. And then as per normal, my shameless little advertisement, if you're interested in some of the things we're putting on at, at uh, solarpvtraining.com, just go on in there. We've got online programs as well as face-to-face. Uh, -face. So that is the announcements there. Does anybody else have anything coming up in their world they want to share? Not not good news like you got a puppy, but solar events um, that that are coming up. Anybody want to throw something into the mix? All right. So hearing none, um, I'm going to jump into this particular um, topic for today. And oh, it I've started to see a number of articles that webinar that I just mentioned uh, about Google coming into the solar marketplace. Uh, looking at um, their what they're referring to as their solar API. And so I wasn't even clear exactly what an API is. So uh, I guess I was coming into this new and, and untutored. Uh, but it's not really Google's first jump into the world of solar. Um, they, they did have a project a couple of years ago. They called the Google Project Sunroof. And this particular map that is showing there is really the coverage area that this Google Sunroof project uh, was available in. And just to give you a sense of, of what was involved with this, you could, you could type in an address into their system and it would give you some pretty good data. Uh, it would it would give you, uh, you know what 
how much sunlight was available on that particular roof and, and what size recommendation for a solar array they would they would make based on comparable um, electric usage in that region. Um, so so it was and it and it just came up boom like that. You know, there was no um no design work on your part at all. So kind of a nice little project. Uh, you could get into how much sun is available, how much how many square feet are available on that particular roof. Um, you know, what is the average bill? What size array are you looking at? Uh, and then as you can see in this in this picture here, if I can get that to move up, um, they also show some of the irradiance. Uh, they use LIDAR imagery uh, on this map to uh, give you a 3D estimation and factor in shading and the like. But if you're if you're jumping in and put in a real address like ours, um, you get nothing. You know, it just says we're not available in that area. So the the service area was very very spotty. If you lived in Southern California, no problem. But if you live in in the Midwest, you're just you're pretty much out of luck. So now they've opened up this brand new one. This is just announced like a month or two ago. The solar, uh, the Google API for solar, and API is is a term that stands for application programming interface. You know, some a, a title only an engineer could love. So, this is uh, it. It I guess the first thing I want to stress is this is not a product that you're as a end user going to go out and buy. Uh, this is directed towards developers, software developers primarily, to be integrated into their programming. So that's that's the first thing, you know, it, it's not a new product that you're going to go out and buy that you're going to use to to um, to design your solar. But it is a new feature or or suite of features that are going to start to be integrated into all sorts of other products. Uh, if you do remote site assessment, it will probably be integrated into your remote site assessment program. Um, I'm anticipating uh, realtors are going to be looking at this. I could see a lot of value there. If if you're selling homes and you want to talk about what is the solar potential of these homes, if you're selling electric vehicles and you want to talk about the charging potential for that electric vehicle. So, so that I'm sure they've got a lot of market for that. There's probably other applications, you know, that, that nobody has even thought about yet for who knows for landscapers um, about gardeners, you know, where's the best place to plant your tomatoes, who knows? Uh, Cause it's all, it's taking a lot of data and, and starting to put it down at the granular address, you know, um, you can look at your home and how much sunlight and what is the shading and what is the orientation and what's the pitch of your roof. You know, ro roofers could, could use these things as well. So what does this API actually capture? Well, the, the system, what Google has done is begin to capture all of the roof measurements, the height, the, the shading, the orientation, and then estimating solar potential. So if you plug in an address into this thing, it's going to pull up something like this. Uh, in this particular case, the house there in the middle um, is showing with the little Google icon there to indicate that that is a, uh, the one you're looking at. And you'll notice these little orangish type circles. These are the different planes of the roof. And if you click on each of those planes of the roof, it brings up what is its um, sunlight potential? What is its uh, square, square meters or square feet? Um, how many panels could you put on that section? What's the slope? What's the pitch? You know what shading issues. Um, so so pretty pretty detailed um, information there. Um, then they also get shading throughout the day, but also throughout the year. So you can get essentially 365 um, shading analysis. Now just simple, where it'll show you uh, based on color scheme. Uh, where's the sunny part of the roof? I think we could probably figure out the south is better than the north, but they're going to show you that in in uh, pictures. 
And then they have this other um, LIDAR type imagery here. And, and I found this kind of interesting because you can take this shading and with a little slide bar at the bottom, you can move it across and see time of day, month of year. Uh, you can get a better sense of where is the sun hitting, where is it um, going to be shaded, that kind of thing. Then you can use this to automatically determine where is the best place on the roof to put your panels and what it's going to look like uh, once this starts to do the panels. So in this example, I just had it uh, throw up nine panels. It's a little slide bar there, and it gives you the details as to where the nine panels should be located, um, given this particular roof. Uh, if you want to increase it, just slide that bar across. So this one took it up to 35 panels. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's it's giving you, you know, that laying it out based on the shading. You can see where these things should probably be located. Hopefully somebody is going to pop in there and, uh, and begin to uh, do some real world assessing of, of what this is, you know, I mean, there is some human design work still in here. Um, so, so where, what are they planning on? How are they going to be selling this thing? Um, well, Google is uh, looking that they're anticipating about a hundred million dollars in sales just from this API in the first year, which uh, sounds like an awful lot of money. But I found that, for example, uh, Uber paid Google $58 million for integrating Google Maps data into their apps. Um, so, so I guess there's a lot of money to be had in this kind of data gathering and reselling. Um, and, and I also found that it's interesting, while they were rolling out the thing about solar, they also are collecting um, air quality and pollen data at the same time. So they package these all three uh, announced at the same, same time. So if you're an app developer and you want to begin to integrate, what is the pollen count at this location at this time, time of day, time of year, um, you know, you can, you can put that in there. And uh, increasingly, uh, you know, at Blue Rock Station, we see most of our interns and it seems like every guest is somehow you know, having allergies and and uh, uh, they they just fall apart when they get out into the country. So I can I guess see this kind of uh, app requirement for that kind of thing for air quality mix. So so those are kind of interesting, and I suspect this is just the first of a lot. You know, I don't know what other kind of data they can begin to, uh, you know, they're gathering information on everything and they're going to begin to integrate this stuff into Google Maps or their other applications and then sell these things. So, um, yeah, don't think you've, you're private about anything. So I was looking at uh, pricing just to get a sense of it. I saw these um, uh, the, they're they're selling this at a monthly cost. So. For a very small application, like let's say your own website or something like this, when it showed a thousand, and I'm assuming these are usages per month, they weren't clear about that, but I can't imagine it's per year or per day since the co cost is monthly. So a uh, thousand um, per month, you were looking at about 85 bucks for the monthly cost of the solar applications there. If you start getting up into some of the bigger numbers, uh, I just slid that over to 200,000. And now you're looking in the $14,000 range. So this is how Google is looking at pricing this stuff. So it really is just for developers um, of software programs primarily, which kind of led me into thinking about, okay, well, what kind of remote software programs are out there um, servicing the solar industry. Uh, I, I, I've heard of a number of them, but I didn't know how exhaustive that was. So, so just to let you know some of the process, I decided to try and Google top 10 um, uh, software, remote software assessment tools. And that got me nowhere. Uh, I started getting 10 best lists and every list seemed to have different people. Um, so anyway, so I just thought I'd share some of the pricing because 
it's it's kind of all over the place. Uh, if you do these remote assessments, um, if you do this for a living, yeah, maybe some of the prices is justified. But if you're just wanting to design a system for your own home, uh, you some of these like Solograph, the one at the top, and these are in no particular order. Uh, their their fee for the software is two hundred and twenty nine dollars per month, um, or you can get something like Solar Solar Gis, I guess it's called two thousand dollars a year. Um, Web Cloud Solar twenty bucks a month. Solar Labs thirty nine a month. Enact two thirty nine. PV Sketch and and i'm kind of mad at pv sketch at the moment cuz i've been using them for a, a good long while a couple of years and what got me into using them is because i don't do that many assessments so they had an option that said okay you can do up to 5 assessments uh 5 designs a month and if you're doing that we're only going to charge you 4 bucks per you know so that's fine you know 4 bucks is 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 a good price to do a design um, and, and then it's supposed to reset the next month. Well, it never does. Um, you do five and then you start getting these error messages that say, oh, you've used up the maximum. You need to now subscribe for $50 a month. So I would call them up and I would say, you guys, this is all messed up. You're not resetting it. And you jump through all sorts of hoops and eventually they reset it. So then I set up multiple accounts under different email addresses and each one of them would block after five. And then I talked to other people and they're being blocked after five. So clearly it's a marketing strategy that they're just trying to force you into this $50 a month subscription um, because now they don't even return my calls or answer the emails or anything. So, so I'll tell you what I'm going to be doing, but I'm mad at them. It's a good program. I, I like the program. It's simple to use, but, um, but it's, they just lost me as a customer. Um, PV Sol, thousand dollars a year, PV CAD, 180 and so on and so forth down, down the list. Um, I, I was, some of these, it's a little bit hard to figure out how much they charge, you know, and it always makes me suspect when you get into a product and they say, call us and let a salesman walk you through for a pre free demonstration. And I'm like, can you give me some indication of how much this is going to cost? And if they're not willing to tell me how much they're going to charge, I don't want to talk to their salesman. Um, but some of them, like the Lyra Solar, it was talking about it was a hundred dollars. Um, it was it, it was a fairly reasonable price, but then I saw that they have um solar permitting, um, where you can get a, a an application package. And and most of these systems will offer this for a fee. So you go in and you design your system, but then you can get um AHJ uh, ready uh, permit packages where you get all the line drawings and the electrical drawings and the maps and the layouts and all of this, and they can be customized to your company um, and, and they charge you for it. And, and that's fair and reasonable um, if you want to do that. But I, then I saw Lyra Solar was saying, okay, we'll charge you. And it runs about a hundred bucks per application package um, but they're saying you got to have a minimum of 20 a year just to use our software. So that's that's the first one I saw where they're saying we're going to lock you into not only the design, but also the uh, the application package as well. And again, if you do this for a living, maybe not a big problem. But if you're just playing around with it, I don't want to spend a couple thousand dollars on something like that. Uh, and different projects, they have different focuses. Some of them deal with ground-mounted systems, some are utility scale, and so on and so forth. Um, the the top selling ones, I, I decided to try and drill down just a wee bit. Aurora Solar is the top selling residential design software. It runs about $159 a month for, for that subscription. Uh, Helioscope, these are all ones I'm very aware of. Um, top selling commercial and industrial, the same price, 159 bucks a month. So they they obviously have tailored their focus slightly differently for the different marketplaces. And I hadn't heard about this, but Solar Edge um, has a really nice free 
uh, design program. So if you're going to use Solar Edge products, I would say go ahead and go into the Solar Edge design and use that. You can 3D model, you can do all the things that these systems are. It's all free, but it does direct you only to use Solar Edge products. So um, you know you're going to be designing that, but that may not be a big deal. Um, you know, you're just wanting to get a sense of cost, a sense of design, and you can decide which inverter system you want to use later. Um, and but it's very nice, very nice there. And then open solar, and this is the one that I'm moving to um, away from PV sketch. You know, if you care, I, this one is free as well, and and it's actually quite a nice program, very very good, um, and it's it's completely free. And on their website, they talk a lot about how do we make this thing free? They try and present themselves and I take them at their word. They're, they're out to try and change the world and they're kind of the rebels of all of this. But what they found is they can charge manufacturers for product placement within their software. So when you go ahead and design your system and you select a, a panel, because you have to tell all of these systems which panel you're gonna use, because they have all the dimensions in the database and they start laying these things out based on those dimensions. Um, or if you select an inverter system like Solar Edge or Enphase, um, then they integrate in their spec sheets and a little bit of advertising, not very much, but it all gets packaged into your design so that then they're anticipating when you go out to install these things, your customer, you, you're gonna use that product. So, so that's how they're paying for this design software is they're kind of trying to get prominent placement in the uh, selection criteria. Of, of which product, which manufacturers you're going to use for the for the different things you're specking out. So that's that's fair. I mean, it's good good software, and uh, I'm willing to put up with a little bit of a uh, little bit of promotion there. So Jay, um, yeah, Jay, I just have one suggestion with that because I use the Solar Edge when they design my system for me, but uh -huh. I would imagine it would be the same for the rest of them. Do not take everything in there is 100% correct. We had to make a couple modifications to their layout because the wire the wiring was not the right gauge and it, it would have just burnt if we hadn't checked it. So it's just a suggestion if you're going to use any of those to make sure you have the capability to check to make sure that the data they're using is correct. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, I have found, for instance, you can say um, select the, the utility rate to get an economic assessment. And I've often found that the utility rates don't match what's on the bill. So, you know, garbage in, garbage out. You're, you know, take your, um, take it with a grain of salt, as you said. Um, okay, so I, I thought, cause some of you guys may not have ever used these, um, these systems at all. So I wanted to give you kind of a sense of, uh, they all work similarly. I shouldn't say they all do, but but the basic ones work like this. Um, this is actually PV Sketch um, showing you that you're. it's already integrated in with Google, with Google Maps, Google Earth. Um, so when you type in your address, it's gonna bring up an aerial picture of that particular location. And then you can zoom on in. This is one that I did a while ago. Um, so I just grabbed this as an example, but you can take the roof areas and you just simply draw um, the sections where you think that the rays are going to be. Uh, you tell it which which solar panels you're going to use, and then it populates those and then gives you a production estimate based on the azimuth, the the slope, and uh, the or um, the um, size and the panel that you've selected. And it gives you a pretty good, pretty rough, you know, it's similar to what you'll see in um, PV Watts, because I look at those as well, and I think they must grab the data from there. So once you've designed your system, um, sized it out, they're gonna want you to um, put in the electric usage. So you just go in month by month, adding in how many kilowatt hours are they using each month. That gives you uh, some information there. And then it's going to say, what, what is the rate 
that you're paying. And this is where, as I was just telling Chris, this is where the data, I always find it wrong. Um, so I'll take their electric bill and calculate it for myself. And you can see it says enter my own. So you can just plug in the rate that you've determined uh, as the rate that you're going to use here rather than relying on their database. And then once you've got their database in there or your, your costs, then you can plug in a per watt system cost. So in this case, we're just taking a rough estimate to put in on this one, $2.80 a watt for this installation. So it's telling me then that the gross cost, that the upfront cost is going to be about $253,000. And um, then you can put escalations in there. Yeah, Pete? Um, I just want to mention to people that um, electric bills, of course, come in fixed charges and monthly charges, or um, fixed charges and variable charges. And the variable charges frequently include taxes, fees, and on and on, at least here in Wisconsin. Uh -huh. And the rate that I'm paying variable is considerably different than the posted rate variable because of those savings on taxes and on and on. And it would be in people's interest to go through some bills, consecutive bills, and run through two equations, two unknowns, and find out actually what they are paying for the variable cost, the cost per kilowatt hour, because it's not necessarily um, what the electric company says it is. You know, it will affect your savings. Yeah, in fact, I would say it's almost never what the utility company says it is. Um, they'll always tell you what the generation rate is and leave out transmission or distribution or um, some of the other fixed charges. And you also have to see, um, are these, I forget the term that they have for it, but some of these costs are based on the amount of usage. So if I reduce my usage, those other costs are reduced as well. And some of them are non-bypassable, you know, they're going to be there regardless. So, and, and sometimes they throw in some you know, paying for the Spanish American War kind of charges in there. They'll they'll oftentimes um the my favorite one is a lot of utilities will put in what they call a renewable energy charge. And and it looks like you're having to pay extra because you're using some portion of a renewable energy. But really what it is is they've they've somehow not met their uh, state mandated renewable portfolio standards. So they're being fined and then they're passing this fine along to you because they didn't do their job. So anyway, utility companies, what do you want? Um, so you can you can put in some, uh, uh, you can talk about how much loss is going to happen each year. What is the escalation going to be on, on prices, things like that. And so you can get a, a sense of what the price will be. And then there's typically a place where you can add in the various incentives that are out there to help pay for these systems. Um, with every system today in the US, you're gonna be seeing a 30% tax credit. That's standard now. Uh, it was extended for a period of 10 years under the Inflation Reduction Act. So that's um, that's happening uh, in other places. Uh, for example, there are 10% uh, if you're in a fossil fuel region. Um, so a place that's predominantly been reliant on on the harvest or on the extraction of fossil fuels, or if it's a census um, district that's adjacent to where a a coal mine or a coal power plant has been shut down. Then you can get an extra 10% bump there. So you would put that in there, 10% tax credit. If you're using and qualify on the domestic um, product, um, that's gonna be another 10%. Then there's uh, SREX. So in some communities, you can get solar renewable energy certificate credit. So, that, so we put that in. Uh, I was doing some of these for USDA um, grants and the USDA grant goes up to 50%. So that can be then added in there. And then for commercial systems, you can do um, accelerated depreciation. And what's interesting is the accelerated depreciation will also count towards half of the tax credits. So if you're getting 40% tax credit because you're in a fossil fuel region and 30% uh, just automatic, you can actually depreciate half of that. 
So your depreciation would be on 80% of your basis if if that's what you're dealing with, which to me seems like a little bit of double dipping, but but hey, we'll take it. Um, so you put all of those in there and, and very often the price becomes um, very, very low. In fact, and this is where I was going to hopefully not mess things up, but I wanted to uh, share the screen because once once you're in that place, um, then you'll get a report something like this. And so the um, you'll get a proposal. It'll show what is the first year savings, how many watt, um, kilowatt hours are being produced. It integrates in the diagram. It'll show how many panels. In this case, it was 270, eight inverters. Um, and it shows the offset. So in, in this particular uh, example, we're producing 98% of estimated usage, uh, the average saved each month, and then where the customer is always looking at it. How long before it's paid back? And this particular system would pay for itself in a year and a half. So um, because of all of the incentives, uh, commercial, rural commercial systems have when you talk about the REAP grant and everything, the Rural Electrification for America program, which uh, can pay up to 50%. And then you get into some of the detail sheet and the like. So, so this is the kind of report these things will spit out. And it's a very nice preliminary report uh, for companies to, uh, to uh, you know, if you're out selling. So... All right. Um, anybody have any any questions? Uh, anything you you would like to uh, add to that discussion? I feel like I've rambled on long enough. Okay. Give you just a second. Otherwise, we're gonna call this quits. Okie doke. Well, that'll be it. And uh, I appreciate your attention. And we'll see you guys next week. Then. All right. Take care.